Good afternoon and welcome to the Melanoma Research Foundation Ask the Experts series presented by Castle Biosciences. We are thrilled to present this series during the month of April. And today we are starting with our very first session, which is focused on educating and empowering the melanoma community. Throughout the month of April, we will feature a variety of topics and we're very excited to kick off our first session today with Dr. Abel Jarrell and melanoma survivor, Robert Clark, who will be speaking on the melanoma patient journey. My name is Kylie Lapira, CEO for the Melanoma Research Foundation, and we are so thankful to Castle Biosciences for sponsoring this really incredible series during the month. I wanna start off by introducing our first speaker, Dr. Abel Jarrell, an extremely accomplished physician when you hear about all of his accolades. He is a double board certified derm dermatologist and dermatopathologist. He obtained his training through the Harvard Dermatology Program where he served as chief resident. And he also participated and got his fellowship at UCSF in dermatopathology. He received his medical degree from Harvard Medical School and he holds a bachelor in science in chemistry from the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, where he was a distinguished cadet, which for those of you who don't know, that means finishing in the top 5% of your class. Additionally, he has received his extensive training in surgery, having completed more than three years of training in neurosurgery, if you can believe that, before changing his career path to dermatology. As part of his obligation to the U.S. Army, Dr. Jarrell served as brigade surgeon and completed combat tours in both Iraq and Afghanistan, where he was twice nominated for the Bronze Star Medal. Dr. Jarrell served out his military obligation on the faculty of Walter Reed National Medical Center right here outside of Washington, DC, where the MRF is based. And he um, participated, or he served with the Reed National Medical Center in the departments of dermatology and dermatopathology. While at Walter Reed, he founded and directed the Walter Reed Melanoma and Pigmented Lesion Clinic. Currently, as if that wasn't enough, he is the medical director and chief investigator of a company he helped found, Alcutis Research Inc., the Center for Understanding Therapeutics in Skin. Just extremely accomplished physician and we'll hear from him in just one minute. We're also very thrilled to have Robert Clark, melanoma survivor, who's gonna join us after Dr. Jarrell's presentation to talk about his experience. Robert is a safety champion and lead incident investigator at Gold Bond Building Products and has employed in the Jimson field for 16 years. He's been nominated for his company's Safety and Excellence Award and is also a valued forklift instructor for the Portsmouth plant. He's currently working towards being a certified safety professional and he loves spending time with his family, especially his wife, Kara, daughter, Kendall, and furry friend, Zeke. So again, we are thrilled to have Dr. Joel and Robert here with us today. And again, very grateful for Castle Biosciences for their sponsorship of our Ask the Expert program. Castle Biosciences is an innovator in diagnostic and prognostic tests for dermatologic cancers. And they have partnered with the Melanoma Research Foundation to host our second Ask the Expert series for this year. Again, occurring every Tuesday through the month of April. This series will focus on the melanoma patient journey and managing a melanoma diagnosis. Again, Castle Biosciences is a skin cancer diagnostic company. So what that means is providing personalized genomic information to improve cancer treatment decisions. They're focused on providing physicians and patients with personalized, clinically actionable genomic information to make more accurate treatment decisions. The company currently offers tests for patients with cutaneous melanoma, along with squamous cell carcinoma, suspicious pigmented lesions, and uveal melanoma, which is melanoma of the eye. Castle also has active research and development programs for tests in other dermatologic diseases with high clinical need. Here at the Melanoma Research Foundation, we know that education is critical for patients to make informed decisions about their care. That is why we are thrilled to provide this educational series called Ask the Expert, with today's first session focusing on the melanoma patient journey. Before we get, begin the presentation, just a couple minutes of housekeeping. We encourage people to use the comments to ask questions during the presentation 
which will be addressed at the end. The information provided today is for educational purposes only, and we encourage individuals to discuss treatment questions directly with their healthcare provider. Again, we encourage everyone to visit melanoma.org to utilize our free resources like our treatment center finder and other free resources as they navigate their care. And with that, I am going to turn it over to the very distinguished Dr. Jarrell to do a brief presentation on the melanoma patient journey. Dr. Jarrell. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much, Kylie. That was a very generous introduction. I appreciate it. And thank you to Liz Holland from Castle Biosciences for inviting me to uh, deliver this presentation. It's such an honor and a privilege and such a pleasure for me to be able to present on what I consider the most important diagnosis that we have in dermatology. Today, we're gonna focus on cutaneous melanoma with an emphasis on the patient journey. Uh, as Kylie mentioned, we'll have one of my favorite patients who I've come to know over the years, uh, Mr. Robert Clark is going to focus on, on his journey. But before we get into that, I want to just uh, say a few words about, uh, about melanoma. And, and before that, I want to just uh, talk about very quickly, I currently practice in the seacoast of New Hampshire. In, uh, this is Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And I'm a dermatologist, dermatopathologist, as Kylie mentioned. And my relevant disclosures are that this talk was sponsored by Castle Biosciences. Now, getting into the, the focus of this discussion, this is a, a picture of, of melanoma here. And I think most people would be able to identify this as, as something not so good. This is a, a young man, 30s, who entered my clinic a few years ago with this uh, very large pigmented lesion that was immediately obvious to me uh, as something not good, uh, an, an apparent melanoma, if you will. But if you also notice, there are a lot of what we would call suspicious uh, nevi on this patient's back. So this is a person who's definitely in need of a dermatologist. And I'm gonna go into that in a little bit more detail. But if you present in my clinic with a lesion like this, most likely, this is what's going to happen to you. This is me taking a scalpel to do an excisional biopsy here. Now, again, this is more of an, of an obvious melanoma, and uh, I'll describe more about what melanoma is, the type of skin cancer in a bit. But by way of introduction, this is what most melanomas come to my office looking like. In fact, this gentleman, 60s, didn't even realize that he had melanoma on his leg. He was coming to me for what he thought was athlete's foot here. And you know, I quickly recognized this as athlete's foot. And as a dermatologist, we're all very well trained to fix this pretty easily. But what I was far more concerned about was this variegated, pigmented, large melanocytic lesion on his lower left leg. In, der in dermatology, we use special scopes called dermatoscopes where we can amplify what a melanoma looks like. And you can see beyond uh, what, the, what the naked eye can provide, some features that are quite worrisome for melanoma. This is an odd shape. It has irregular borders. There's different colors in it. It's greater than six millimeters. And those are some of the main features, the so-called ABCDs, and also the ugly duckling that one might see when presenting with, with a melanoma. So what happens next when this patient has a melanoma? Now, I mentioned that, that I'm also a dermatopathologist, and I understand that this picture probably doesn't mean a lot to people, but I'll, qu I'll quickly orient you. This is a picture of the skin, a melanoma, with a lot of pigmentation here. This is not normal. This is a lot of that, that, that really dark coloration that you see. So this is the skin, what it looks like under the microscope. This is the epidermis up here. The dermis is this layer in here through the middle, and these globular whitish structures are actually just sebaceous glands, oil glands. Now what's unusual and obviously wrong with this particular, uh, particular histopathology is that this is a melanoma. These cells here are melanocytes. Now melanocytes should normally live along the basal layer of the epidermis. So this lower part of the epidermis, Melanocytes are scattered at a ratio of about one to 10 to regular skin cells, this being a regular skin cell up here. These white spots are called keratinocytes or just regular skin cells. And along the basal layer, there's normal 
melanocytes. Well, in this particular uh, photomicrograph that I'm showing you, this is melanoma. These cells all in through here, you can vaguely see their outlines are in places that they shouldn't be. And under the microscope, they, al they also look quite irregular and what we would call malignant. So this is definitely a malignant melanoma. Now, one other important thing I, I wanna mention is for many, many years, decades in fact, this is how we diagnose melanoma under the microscope. You see a microscope back here if you happen to be looking at my little thumbnail. This is what a dermatopathologist uses to look at uh, the, the skin tissues and describe the various features that will outline what the, what the prognosis is. Now, before I get into that, I'm just gonna give you a little bit more back down, background on melanoma in general. In the United States, at least in, in 2017, there were about 72,000 uh, invasive melanomas reported. Approximately 10,000 patients die of melanoma. So we say about 80,000 melanomas, about 10,000 people die, and about 60,000 of those patients with invasive melanoma present thankfully with early stage melanoma. And I'll describe in a second what stage one, stage two, stage three, and stage four melanoma are, but about 60,000 of these invasive melanomas that present are at stage one or two. But what makes this tricky for us doctors that take care of melanoma patients is even though this is the overwhelming majority of melanoma patients, a great number of them actually go on to metastasize. Metastasize means that when the melanoma leaves that confined area on the skin and ends up going to other parts of the body, say the lungs or the brain, uh, which is stage four disease, which at least still in the 2020s remains a very deadly disease, despite remarkable advances in the last couple of decades, uh, various treatments that are available to prolong people's lives with melanoma and even cure melanoma in some cases. But the bottom line is it still remains an extremely dangerous and deadly disease when it progresses to stage three and stage four disease. Now, back to the histomicrograph here, I wanna focus on some of the features that make the diagnosis for melanoma without going into too much detail. And also some of those features that will outline what the prognosis is for melanoma. So when we look at under the microscope, the, the histology, you can obtain the diagnosis by looking at it as what I described before, malignant melanocytes in places where they shouldn't be throughout the skin. And this concept of Breslow depth, now also called the American Joint Committee on Cancer depth. This is the depth of the melanoma that goes from up here, this is called the granular layer, down to the furthest depth of where the malignant melanocytes go. Now, the reason why I'm belaboring this, this point is because this is almost everything in melanoma diagnosis and prognosis and how we grade and stage various melanomas. Melanoma is the only human malignancy that's measured in a fraction of a millimeter. Now, that's significant because the greater the depth of your melanoma, the more deadly per se it is. And that's where the, the stages come from. A stage one melanoma is anything less than 0 0.8 uh, millimeters. Stage two is one millimeters to two millimeters. Um, stage three is anything between two and four millimeters and stage four. Now remember, I'm talking about what it looks like under the microscope, not the, the um, AJCC staging, which I'll get into in a little bit of detail. But again, I don't want to belabor a lot of details. The, the most important point being that the greater the depth of your melanoma, this so-called Breslow depth, the more worrisome it is. Ulceration is also another feature that we look at in melanoma. If there is an ulceration, which an ulceration is a disruption of the epidermis here. So for example, this particular melanoma is not ulcerated because you see a nice consistent line of epidermis across the entire surface of the melanoma. But if there was a piece of melanoma, I'm sorry, a piece of epidermis missing here and the melanoma was jutting through it, then it would be considered ulcerated. And that gives you one half grade, so to speak, of increased dangerousness if there's uh, ulceration. 
We also evaluate the number of mitoses and regression and tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, which I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail. I know that's a kind of a mouthful of information, but suffice it to say that by far the most important feature of a melanoma is the Breslow depth in grading it and then determining what the subsequent uh, AJCC stage is. In the last seven or eight years or so, uh, Castle Biosciences has developed a genomics expression profile test, which is essentially a, 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 a genome, an expression that will describe the biological behavior of a melanoma and whether it's more likely to behave in a benignant manner, i.e. not kill you, or in a more aggressive manner, i.e. more dangerous, more likely to affect your overall survival, or more likely to uh, progress to metastatic disease. And it's somewhat binary in that a class one result predicts that the patient is going to do very well. And a class two result predicts that this is a, a melanoma that's more likely to behave in an, in an aggressive manner and, and needs to be uh, watched a little more closely. Now back to these survival curves that uh, are described by the uh, American Joint Committee on Cancer, this staging that I was referring to, a melanoma in situ, which go back a couple of slides here. Melanoma in situ means that that stage is zero melanoma and all of the malignant melanocytes are confined to the epidermis. Whereas stage one melanoma predicated by the Breslow death and so forth, stage two. Stage three is if melanoma has already been identified in the lymph nodes and stage four is metastatic disease, meaning that the melanoma has gone elsewhere throughout the body. And as you can see in these Kaplan-Meier survival curves, and granted, this is somewhat outdated data. It's from uh, 2012, but not much has changed in terms of the overall numbers and the staging and the severity of this in that a stage four disease predicts a, a very uh, ominous uh, survival rate, whereas uh, Patients with stage one disease generally do very well. Melanoma in situ should theoretically have a 100% survival rate as the melanoma is confined to the epidermis and, and so forth here. You can see that stage three, if the melanoma, melanoma has been identified in the lymph nodes, the survival drops off here as you see in this orange curve. Another way of looking at it in terms of five and 10 year survival for stages one and, and stage one and two break down to 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B, 2C, and stage three. And you can see that as the stage goes up, the survival goes down with a very high likelihood of, of high survival at both five and 10 year for the thinnest melanomas, stage 1A, which means they had no ulceration and they were less than 0.8 millimeters in thickness. So again, that fraction of a millimeter and how important it is to identify the depth of a melanoma. Uh, my final slide here before I turn it over to my good friend and patient, uh, Robert Clark here, is to just say that, again, we can't necessarily predict from the histology which patients are going to have, let's say, their primary tumor melanoma here and which is going to metastasize either to the lymph nodes, to the lungs, to the brain, to the liver, to the gut, and, and elsewhere throughout the body. So this remains uh, very much an un unmet need uh, in melanoma. And we're thankful for the ability to prognosticate with the uh, Castle Biosciences uh, Genomic Expression Profile Test. Now with that, I'm going to hand the stage over to my patient, Robert Clark, who's going to focus on his journey. And I just wanna show a couple of pictures if that's okay, Robert. Uh, this is, uh, Robert in his, uh, in his normal happy life. And uh, he came to me for the very first time because he noticed uh, this lesion on the back of his neck. So or we will call that behind his left ear. So uh, kudos to him and his wife and, and to whoever helped him say, uh, that thing probably shouldn't be there. I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail because I'm gonna let Robert tell you about it. But because of the location of this melanoma and the other features that I was talking about a bit ago, I thought that he would be best served by a surgical oncologist. So I referred him to a surgical oncologist who did a rather large excision, as you can see here, to uh, continue curing this, this melanoma on Robert. And uh, that's what uh, he ended up with shortly after his surgery. Thankfully, he's healed beautifully and looks much, much better than, than what you're seeing in front of you there. 
So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to hand it over to Kylie and Robert to take over here. Great, thanks Dr. Jarrell. And with that, I'm gonna pass the mic over to Robert to share a little bit about his journey with melanoma. Hi guys, thanks for having me. Um, so basically what happened with me was uh, I was watching my face one night and um, my ear, my hand flipped over my ear and I kind of looked in the mirror and I saw a big black spot there. And I was like, and I knew that hadn't been there before when I've seen, you know, checking out myself before. I didn't know what melanoma was. I'd heard it. Uh, I'd seen TV shows like um, Nip Tuck and, and Fringe that, uh, you know, said it a couple times. So it kind of popped in my head that I knew it was around, but I didn't know quite what it was. But I knew that spot, how big it was. It looked actually like a perfect heart by the time I saw Dr. Jarrell. And uh, I went online and looked it up. And I knew for a fact that that shouldn't be on me like that. And I knew it was morphing. Um, because I had some pictures uh, that we we scoured through over the years, and it wasn't there, so um, I went and saw Doctor Jarrell, panicking, because <laughs> um, in my head I I knew I had it, um, but I was I kept telling myself you know it's going to be okay you know it's probably nothing. Uh, Doctor Jarrell was real professional with it too, but even when he took it like he, I saw him for, <laughs> I think I met him for like. 30 seconds to a minute before he was already in the process of taking that off. I knew it, I knew it needed to come off. Um, and uh, so then really for me, the, the hardest part was the waiting game for the testing. <laughs> um, Cause you, you know, they, they need to test it and they need to retest everything and make sure what they're looking at is what they're looking at. Uh, so I, I panicked, I cried a little bit thinking about it, you know, going through the, the panic stages. Cause you're looking at the uh, like, I'm thinking to myself, what if it's stage four? is you know is this end game for me right now um so i actually had a work trip where i went to new orleans so it, that whole week actually ended up being fine for me i didn't really think about it you know because i was working down there but got the call back um found out it was stage one with a 95 percent survivability which kind of you know that sounds good but in your head when you hear survivability rates as opposed to uh hey you're going to be fine uh, that's that's when the panic hit me because at that point still that was just on this one here i didn't know if we had had any more so he called me back in to get a full body screen and it turns out that's really the only spot that was concerning but um yeah so i had a stage one with a depth of i, I believe it was 0 0.6 millimeters so it's just right on that right on that threshold that i don't want to be on but went down to mass general everything moved pretty quick i, I believe i found out and beginning of June, middle of June and uh, July 3rd, I had my surgery of 2019. And um, ever since then, everything's been good. Uh, I go and see Dr. Jarrell every three months. I think I just moved up to the six month plan now. So that's good. <laughs> but uh, after the initial panic, I was, <laughs> I was okay. I mean, I got lucky. I, I wish I uh, was more educated on this before. I could have caught it while it was stay, still sedate zero. Um, but Hopefully other people can find these things better than I can because I got, I got really, really lucky. I mean, it's still, uh, it's still in the back of my head all the time when I get checked, I'm like, am I going to find something else? Um, obviously it's not a type of cancer. You don't want to have any cancer, but I really don't want this one because <laughs> it's a scary one. And, um, luckily, luckily we caught it when we did, thank God to Dr. Jarrell being able to pull that thing off me and the Dr. Mullen and Dr. Tanabe and, um, at, Mass General Hospital in Boston for helping me out there too. Big lifesavers there. Um, and really for me, if only advice I can say is get, get your skin checked because everyone goes out in the sun. Who knows how I got this? It could have been a genetic thing. I don't know, but um, just check yourself because it was not a fun trip to go especially for my family too. When we started looking into the uh, survivability rates and too and really it was after mass general uh tested the the slides that they took off the skin that they took out uh that's when i kind of got a little bit of relief because uh that's when they actually went really in there and, and cleared the margins in there and um so but that's about all i got just <laughs> surviving one day at a time <laughs>
Well, thank you so much, Robert. Thank you for sharing your story. And it sounds like you are very proactive with your with your care and noticing something and going in right away, which we know increases uh, people's survivability of this disease. So that was incredible of you and your family to really be on top of it. So thank you for sharing your story. And we'll come back to you with a couple of questions in a minute. Um, something that you touched on, and, and I'm sure you probably had a lot of questions for Jarrell, Dr. Jarrell, but Dr. Jarrell, maybe I'll start with you. You know, you see a lot of patients. We know that melanoma cases are on the rise, that the rate of melanoma is increasing. Um, year after year, even though the death rate is decreasing as new FDA approved treatments are coming to market. Can you just address a little bit about the questions that, that patients pose to you when they're diagnosed with melanoma? You know, what are, what are some of those initial questions that, that they have? You know, what, what are the gaps in education that you're helping to fill upon diagnosis? I think that some of the most important trends that I've seen over the years of, of having done um, work with, with melanoma patients for now almost 15 years is that uh, I, I believe the, the public is a lot more educated about the dangers of the sun and the importance of protecting yourself from the sun. And just in general, I think that the, the questions, even though I don't feel like our intelligence of melanoma has increased very much, I would say the patient's level of intelligence of understanding what melanoma is has gone up quite a bit. And maybe that's through being able to research on the internet or whatever. Uh, Robert Clark immediately uh, mentioned in, in his journey that one of his, even before he came to see me, he already started researching melanoma because he thought this was something that, uh, that was uh, not right. So, you know, clearly that's something that, uh, uh, you know, through just, you know, the advent of, of having that, uh, ability to do research on your own it has been a, a trend where, where patients come with all, armed with a lot more knowledge, sometimes incorrect knowledge, but uh, generally with a lot more knowledge than they did 15 years ago. Are you finding though that patients are surprised when you diagnose melanoma? You mentioned with Robert that you then referred him to a medical oncologist and that a lot of people think, well, it's just skin cancer. You know, you just cut it out. Why am I now going to see a medical oncologist, is that something that you are still experiencing? So that is a, is a very difficult question because, and that's very much on a case by case basis. Robert, to his credit, was a smart man. I could tell from the get go, he knew what was going on and he actually knew that he had a, 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 a problem that, that was concerning, you know, from the minute I, I, I met him. And that's why he, he had suggested, we, we didn't waste any time getting down to business. A lot of times I have to explain to patients exactly what you said. So the opposite end of the spectrum, not a Robert, is a patient who comes in and they have no idea, they didn't even know they had this, and this is the majority of patients, they had no idea that this thing behind their ear or on their back or on their leg was even there as you know, the, the patient that I mentioned, the 60 something year old man, he came to me for athlete's foot and he had this lesion on his leg and I had to convince him that I didn't like that, that mole and uh, also a pretty intelligent man. So when I explained to him that, that it was uh, a type of skin cancer and, and, and you also have to take a step back when you're, when you're talking to patients as, as a physician and you know, put your, your check on and, and realize that you know, people don't take for granted what, what melanoma is and what different types of skin cancer are and how deadly they are, how deadly they're not. And so you really have to take a pause, take a break, I'm, I'm very fortunate that before I actually see my patients, my medical assistants take pictures of some of the most worrisome and concerning things. I'm pretty sure that before I even walked into Robert's room, my medical assistant showed me a picture of it and I took a breath and I said, oh my God, this, I, I know that this is something kind of serious. And so you have to really put on your doctor cap. You're not talking about acne or a non-life-threatening problem. You're talking about a life-threatening problem and so everything slows down and you have to be very patient and just listen and explain and know that they're gonna have a lot of questions. And, and some of the questions are serious, like doc, is this thing gonna kill me or not? Yeah, absolutely. And it sounded like Robert, you asked a lot of those, those important questions. Um, Robert, this is, this is a question for you. And this is something, you know, a lot of patients 
who are watching today probably experience as well. But you know, what what do you think was the most difficult or challenging part of your melanoma journey? And what what advice would you give a patient right now who's who's going through what you went through? Uh, most challenging thing for me was waiting because I knew, like like Dr. Jarrell said, I knew what it was. Um, there was no getting around it. I knew that that thing was small in before, and then it got bigger. And I read it all that morphing and the size of it, and like the colors of it. I saw the I saw close ups of it too. But the, the hardest part for me was waiting for the actual diagnosis. And then it was like, it's a two part question because, um, or two part answer, I mean, because that was the first part that was the hardest. The second part was when I found out and I had to get surgery and they were clearing it out, waiting for them to let me know on what they tested when they pulled that out. That was, that was probably the hardest actually. Cause uh, right then I didn't know if it had spread and you know, any advice I can tell the, to anybody is just uh, don't, don't panic before you know the answer. Cause I panicked hard. Me and my wife and my daughter, we cried. Uh, Cause it was scary. It's a scary thing. Dr. Jarrell knew when he was talking to me, how upset it was making me. Uh, but just take it one day at a time and don't over panic something until you know that it's time to panic. Um, and luckily for me, that time never came. I, it time came time for action, but I didn't, I shouldn't have panicked. So that's all I can say about that. Well, well, good advice, right? Wait, wait for the information before you before you worry. Um, so, Dr. Joe, this this is really a question for you, and I think you know, Robert, you certainly alluded to it too. Once a patient has melanoma, it's always in the back of their mind. You know, Robert said, you know, he's always it's always there, it's always present once once a patient has gone through this. Um, so maybe we could talk a little bit about you know recurrence and from your uh, dermatopathologist background, you know, is there a way that patients know, oh gosh, I'm more likely for a reoccurrence or I'm not, you know, what are some of those, those tools that they can, that they can go to, to really understand if they're at risk for a reoccurrence? That is a really, really tough question. And generally in my follow-up for patients who have melanoma, I don't schedule them for a regular office visit because I know that it's going to be a, a much longer and, and a serious conversation with a lot of questions like that, that I sometimes don't have the exact answer to. A lot of times we, we simply don't know. So I explain that the basic science, a lot of what I mentioned in, in my talk, I'll tell patients about what the Breslow depth is and what that means, you know, the Breslow depth, again, meaning how thick the melanoma is. And, and I tell them exactly, um, so if your melanoma, as Roberts was at 0.6, that is a very high likelihood of, of surviving this melanoma, that you're going to do well. Um, but in, in a not so uh, grim manner, if somebody has a melanoma that's greater than four millimeters and ulcerated, we know that that has a not so nice prognosis. So I, you know, I generally, you know, that's when you, you know, take your time, COVID notwithstanding, you put your hand on their shoulder and say, you know, you have a, a very serious problem that we're going to do the best we can to try and help you with. But this is, this is not something easy uh, that, but we're going to get through it together. And, you know, just to try and answer your question a little bit better, the bottom line is we don't exactly know and not to get philosophical, but nobody knows when their time is going to come, right? But we, we do the best that we can with the science. And as of today, we have the uh, histology. So the dermatopathology, we look at it under the microscope. We list those features that I mentioned. And then we, uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of the genomic expression profile test, which predicts the biological behavior as I described in, in, in the talk as well. So you get a genetic signature of that particular melanoma. If it comes back 1A, that gives you a very high negative predicted value. I love giving that information to my patients um, because you know as of yet, it hasn't failed me. And I know that the success rate is very, very high in terms of if you tell somebody they have a 1A melanoma, they have a very, very low chance of dying of melanoma. And, and I've seen the, uh, the, the more worrisome melanomas, the, the two Bs that you see as predicted by the genomic expression profile test um, can uh, be, be more concerning. 
Thank you. I think, you know, they always say knowledge is power and certainly for patients, that's really, you know, they want to have some control. So I think having that information, certainly to your point earlier, makes them feel more at ease. And like you said, definitely is good news for you to share with them when you relay that they have a lower chance of recurrence. Um, we are going into Melanoma Awareness Month next month, and we are talking about prevention and early detection. And so with my final question, um, Dr. Jarrell, I will pose this to you. You know, what, what advice do you give your patients about prevention and early detection? Is there any sort of um, standard thing that you always tell people as, they, as we head into the summer months um, about protecting themselves and, and their loved ones from the sun's harmful rays? Yeah, you know, uh, kudos to Robert. He pretty much hit the nail on the head. He uh, he gave he stole the lines from me. He basically said, you know, be very vigilant of your own skin. If you can't see your back, have a loved one. You know, take a look at the areas that you can't see very well to keep an eye on on various moles. Remember the ABCDs, the you know asymmetry, borders, color, diameter. Um, but to your question about going into the summer months and going into the sunshine time, here we are in the Western Hemisphere. Um, I am a big fan of enjoying your life and spending time outside. But what I tell my patients is be smart, uh, seek shade. I personally, I love being in the shade under the trees. When I'm in my boat, I have the bimini pulled over my top so that the sun is not beating on me directly. And I think it's uh, silly and unwarranted to just lie out in the sun. I, in, in this day and age, I don't understand people who do that, but you know, I get it. I know it feels good and, and people want to have fun, but I say, you know, do your best to, to protect yourself. Um, sunscreen is not a perfect solution. It's like wearing seatbelts in a car. You still don't drive like a maniac just because you have your seatbelt on. That means don't lay out at two in the afternoon or at noon just because you have sunscreen on your face and think that it's not going to damage your skin because the sun is still going to damage your skin, sunscreen notwithstanding. And so those are some of the you know typical things that you'll hear from a dermatologist. Well, I love the seatbelt analogy. I think, that's, I think that's a new one for us, so thank you. I would like to thank both of you for joining us today. This has been incredibly informative. This video will live on the MRF's YouTube page going forward, as well as our Facebook page. And with that, this will conclude our first Ask the Expert session sponsored by Castle Biosciences. Again, if anyone watching is looking for more resources, we encourage you to visit the MRF website, melanoma.org. We have tons of educational resources. There's the URL listed there. Our second Ask the Expert live presentation will be happening on Tuesday, April 13th at 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific, again, on the MRF Facebook Live page. We'll hear a presentation from Dr. Brent Moody, who's at Heritage Medical Associate, Dermatology Mohs Center in Tennessee. He'll be discussing familial versus tumor genetics. And again, a big thank you to our partners at Castle Biosciences for sponsoring this entire Ask the Expert series the month of April. And a big thank you to Dr. Jarrell and Robert for their time and for sharing their expertise and personal melanoma journey with us. Thank you all again, and we will see you next Tuesday. Take care.